Ben Minerick, I'm the assistant to the provost, and one of the projects that we started last year was the Distinguished Lecture and Tech Talks. Now, the Distinguished Lecture, um, Dr. Sarah Green is our fourth Distinguished Lecture here. Um, she and the others before, you can look on the website and watch those videos of their talks if you're interested, were selected by a committee. Um, the criteria for selection, we asked department chairs and deans and center directors, institute directors, uh, to make the nominations. And the selection criteria is really some of the very impactful research that we do here at Michigan Tech as well as the connection to the community and the communication of that, the impact to society, both local as well as global. And if you notice, Dr. Sarah Green encompasses all of that. Um, and so I'm not actually going to make the, the introduction. I'm going to introduce Mr. Mike Abbott, who is the one who fielded the nomination on part of the Great Lakes Research Center. Um, and, but I am going to add just a few words here, and that is that um, over the time that I've known Dr. Green um, and the interactions I've had with her, uh, there are a few people that are very prominent in their fields uh, and are accomplishing great things, and you never, would never guess it based on their demeanor and how they carry themselves. In fact, when you're vulnerable enough to show that you have a lack of understanding, they are very gracious in being able to um, teach you what you lack. And um, I would have to say that Dr. Green did this for me. Uh, her analogy that she's going to do today, and that you get to see, talks about the small to the large. And in my own research, I've looked at the very small and had mistaken some of the concepts that are on the large scale, i.e. the scale of the Earth. And she was very gracious in explaining this, and I went, oh, I know that concept, I just never made the connection from the sphere of an atom up to the sphere of the Earth. And so I hope she, her talk does the exact same thing for you. So, Mike, where are you at? I saw you earlier. Wonderful. Um, so this is Mr. Mike Abbott from the Great Lakes Research Center, and he's going to introduce Dr. Green. Thank you very much. It's really a, an honor to be invited to introduce Sarah today. And I'll, I'll read you just a few things that I, I had to glean from her. And you have to pull these out to find out these things. But Sarah's originally from Minnesota. And she's oscillated between fundamental physical chemistry and global issues throughout her career. After completing a, a bachelor's degree in chemistry at the other U of M, she spent a year in Strasbourg, France, studying photovoltaic cells. She's returned to the U.S. then and earned her Ph.D. in marine chemistry at the MIT, MIT Woods Hole Joint Program. Sarah returned to basic chemistry for a postdoc at uh, UT Austin under Professor Marianne Fox. Since coming to Michigan Tech, she's collaborated with numerous people in research groups from mechanical engineering to forestry. She led the Keweenaw Interdisciplinary Transport Experiment in Superior, more often known as KITES, project, which helped establish large lake limnology here at Michigan Tech. KITES brought us the Agassiz and ultimately the uh, Great Lakes Research Center. I thank you for that, otherwise I would be sitting out in the cold. <laughs> After serving nine years as a chair of the Department of Chemistry, Sarah was awarded a Jefferson Science Fellowship and spent a year at the U.S. State Department, where she served as a senior science advisor covering environmental issues in the Asia-Pacific region. So by now you know that Sarah is dedicated to her science. But if you need any more evidence of that, I will tell you that some of you know that we operate uh, coastal buoys in the lakes. We have one out in front of Sarah's house, in fact, <laughs> at North Entry, and it died one time. I had to go out and get it. I had to get our crew out. We're, we're going to have to go out there and get that thing. Well, without a, a buoy out there to tell you what the waves are like, how do you know what the lake state is and whether or not it's safe to go out there? I bemoan this fact to Sarah, and she goes, oh, no problem. I'll send you a text every morning. So as soon as it gets light, I get a text that says, six-foot waves don't come out. <laughs> the next time 
next day it's pretty calm, better get out here fast. <laughs> so Sarah is not only dedicated to science, she's a great colleague and a wonderful friend, and it's my uh, pleasure to introduce Dr. Sarah Green. Here's chlorophyll, 
it gets used in this is an RNA, it gets turned into biomass, it gets buried in the soil, it comes back out, it um, gets taken up by um, phytoplankton in the ocean, it dissolves in the ocean, it circulates around, and it comes out of these deep buried pools <coughs> through our smokestacks into the atmosphere where CO2 is accumulating at about four gigatons <coughs> per year. And this, I have to introduce this picture before, so I wasn't even sure if I should show this movie until I showed it to Adrian, and she went, oh, <laughs> you have to show that. <laughs> so I did not make this movie. This movie is updated periodically. It comes from the NOAA Earth System Research Laboratory in Colorado. And let me give you an outline, and, and then I'll play the movie here. Here's a time clock. It counts forward, and then at the end it counts backwards, you'll see. It has got a map with some dots on it. Those are the dots at the places where carbon dioxide is being measured regularly in the atmosphere. And then there are two graphs here. This one is, a, both of them have um, parts per million carbon dioxide in the atmosphere on this scale, same scale. And this one is geographical space. So this is the South Pole. This is Mauna Loa Observatory in Hawaii where the first measurements were made regularly. This is the North Pole. And this is a time scale at the Mauna Loa <coughs> Observatory. And you can see um, this, just be quiet, let me watch this. Time is marching through. Um, places where the measurements are being made, stations get added and subtracted and added, mostly added, but some of them come and go. We've got the northern hemisphere um, fluctuating, the um, zigzag increase is happening. These measurements were started by uh, Ralph Keeling in 1958 on Hawaii. Um, 1989, the Mauna Loa number went over um, 350 parts per million. It's kind of a touchstone <coughs> number. Um, it's never going to go below that in our lifetimes or our children's lifetimes or our grandchildren's lifetimes. Um, that is not going to happen. It's still going up. They call this, um, this, uh, movie, The Pump Handle, <laughs> you can see why. Um, so what's happening in the Northern Hemisphere? Why is this, why is this zigzagging so much more than North America? So why does it zigzag at all, actually? Seasonal differences, okay, it's a season. So we have a lot of seasonal difference in the northern hemisphere, less in the south. <coughs> What's going on? What's the seasonal difference? <laughs> What's making the seasons take up and release carbon? No, not eating. Plants. Plants, who said plants? <laughs> plants, plants are breathing. They are taking up carbon dioxide during the summer when they're growing. They drop their leaves, they decay, they release that carbon back to the atmosphere. And they are, um, there are more plants in the northern hemisphere because there's more land mass in the northern hemisphere, so there's a lot more breathing. Um, this is about to start going backwards in a minute. So here's our number now, we're at uh, 408 ppm as of last month average. And so you might ask, well, is that different from historical levels of CO2? And so this data comes from ice cores. Um, primarily, there are a number of ice cores where you can actually get bubbles of CO2 out of the, the ice. And ooh, this is really faint. There's a little blue line here. You can see it'll get scrunched up. And these ice cores now have been dated back to 800,000 years. And so you look at the CO2 levels in the atmosphere compared to where they are now, back into history through glacial times. So this, where it's low, that's an ice age. And where it's higher, which 
is changed to a different ice core. Where it's higher, that's um, a warmer period at each glacier, which we were in now. So we're in an ice age glacier right now. And so here is the history as far as we know it from actual measurements of CO2. All right. So what does this increase? This roughly 2 ppm per year over a long time. What is the impact of that increase? Well, um, we know that there's a greenhouse effect on the Earth. And here's the science explanation for it. A short science explanation. The sun is hot. <laughs> it has a high temperature. <laughs> it emits its um, photons in the visible and ultraviolet region. That's the spectrum that we see on the ground. The Earth is not as hot as the sun, happily, but it is still a warm ball in space. So it also emits radiation. It's just much cooler radiation. It's in the thermal infrared. That's kind of the radiation that you hear, feel when you hold your hand by a stove. So it's also emitting radiation. And the amount of radiation that gets into the surface of the Earth or that gets out from the Earth depends on what's going on in the atmosphere. And so we have, um, we can track the, or look at the absorbance of the atmosphere. So this range right here is ozone in the stratosphere that keeps that dangerous UV light from hitting us. It still lets our visible light in so we can see what's going on. Um, there's a bunch of spikes in here where various things, a lot of it is water absorbed, but there's not much radiation either way there. And then there's what we call the atmosphere window, which is where the majority of that heat from the Earth escapes out of. So what CO2 does, and the other people's grasses, is it starts to fill in that window, kind of from the edges to the bottom, um, and there's some impact on some of these other windows. So the expectation is that if we put more greenhouse gas in the atmosphere, the atmosphere will get warmer, and it does. These are measurements from 1880 through the National Climate Data Center, and we get warmer. Okay. We can observe changes also on a regional scale besides a global scale, um, and there are many, many, many metrics for doing this. This is the annual number of days in the frost preseason. So you can plant your tomatoes earlier, leave them in the ground longer, not approximately nine days longer compared to uh, early in the 20th century. Um, we've also observed a number of extreme precipitation events. This is a regional one. This data is actually from Wisconsin, which is a better map of the UP, better to match for the UP. These are basically events where you have more than two inches of rainfall in a single event. So that's a torrential downpour for our area. And the impact of that is um, that our infrastructure that is not built for that suffers. So well, I see civil engineers <laughs> in the audience here. Um, I didn't actually see this, but I was very much inconvenienced from it because um, <laughs> Noel Urban and I were trying to drive to Duluth for a meeting very early in the morning that this happened. And we had to make an enormous detour because it's right in the middle of Route 2 on the way to, um, or close to Route 2. It was also around, washed out of Route 2 on our way to Duluth. So that was inconvenient. Um, here we have not been feeling that heat this summer, really, or this winter. It's been pretty cold, I think. Um, but it's important to recognize that that is not a global cold wave that we're having. This is a very localized effect. And the globe, this is a picture from December looking at a snapshot of what the world looks like in December. All right, um, just to quickly look at another trend here, a couple other things that we've been seeing warming lakes everywhere. Um, and there are hot spots of warming lakes in North America and Northern Europe. Um, we have seen hurricanes. This year we had the phenomenon, or last year, Jose and Maria both coming at the same time. 
hurricanes get their energy from warm surface water. And so you can't say a particular hurricane is due to climate change. There is every expectation that they get stronger with warmer um, surface, surface water. All right, so climate is always changing. You hear that a lot. Um, here's how it's changed in the time of humans. Here's some ancestral humans. Um, I can't tell you much about them. I need to talk to the archaeologists and anthropologists about that. Um, but here's that historical record from the glacial interglacial period um, from the ice cores, temperatures. And these green or blue stripes, I guess they're showing up here, um, show the warm periods. Those are the interglacials. We've been around maybe 200,000 years, plus or minus. There's some dotted lines there. Um, and this is our current interglacial. So this is the last 10,000 years. And this picture up here is what's happened in the last 10,000 years. So our entire history of civilization, if we like, domesticating animals, agriculture, cities, and what that has happened in that warm interglacial period. We have not survived. Um, we have not had civilization during warmer periods. In fact, there hardly are warmer periods. OK, so we can use our science, or very smart people can, to project future climate based on what we know of the greenhouse effect. Um, we're right here in 2017, 2018, you know. We can project ahead in decades. And when I look at this, I like to think that our students are very likely to be alive around then, or certainly kids who are born now are likely to be around at the end of this century. <coughs> So we have a couple of pathways, and which track we're on depends on what we humans do in terms of emitting. How, many, how much more greenhouse gases are we going to put in the atmosphere? Um, if we level out and drop, actually drop our emissions very rapidly, we could warm by a couple of degrees. If we don't do that, um, we can warm by a lot of degrees. Um, this is a lot of degrees. This is really hot. People who are who are worried about the health effects of high temperatures do not project to eight degrees Fahrenheit. They worry at four degrees Fahrenheit about health impacts on humans. Um, here's some future climate projections for um, our local Midwest area. This comes from the U.S. Climate, um, National Climate Assessment. Um, what's the first thing you notice when you see these maps? <laughs> <laughs> I really yelled at these guys. I said, I showed this <laughs> several times, many, many times in the UP, and that's the first thing people say, where are we? You can't. <laughs> to be fair, they, they did listen, and in the, in the 2017 update, um, they have put the they have put the key on there. <laughs> they have put the key and we're not very different from what you expect. All right. <laughs> yeah, maybe we're still blue. Um, so uh, this, you know, again, we can make many, many projections into the future. Um, it'll be warmer towards the mid-century. Um, I think this one is interesting for planners, people who are projecting, you know, what kind of economy are we going to have? What are people, what things going to look like around here? Because I can tell you, if I was living in southern Illinois and I was going to have 25 days of days of 95 degrees, I would be looking north <laughs> and say, where am I going to go on vacation? Maybe I'll move there. All right. Um, I don't know if that's what people will do, but that's what it, that's what I would do. But then I'm already here, so maybe I'll go further north. Um, and there are projection, uh, projections for spring precipitation. I'm not going to go on with all of these projections. Um, the question is, what do, what do we do? Right, well, we're scientists and engineers. <laughs> so what do we do? We go out and study it. <laughs> so lots of studies, 10,000 studies, thousands and thousands of studies of it. <coughs> And these are just the studies of the International Panel on Climate.
climate change, which does these synthesis studies where they're pulling together data from all kinds of peer-reviewed reports. Um, the last one here was 2014, and look it up online. You can read the whole thing if you like. Um, the other, th the next thing that we did. This was me doing this <laughs> with colleagues from Skeptical Science. Um, is we studied the studies because there was a complaint that, well, those studies are just, there's just a few studies that say we're having climate change and the others are, there's a lot of people, there's a lot of dispute. Is it true or not? Um, well, we found 97% of the papers that talk about climate change agreed that it was changing and humans were responsible. Um, this experience gave me a real appreciation for PR people, Chris Allison, <laughs> PR people. Um, the John Cook, is from Australia, and he really promoted this. He had a whole group putting up these, these logos, and also it came out at the right time. Um, this paper got tweeted by, by the president. It got featured on a, on a uh, John Oliver segment. So we were really excited. No, none of my other papers have had this kind of <laughs> attraction. I was looking for the next one, but I haven't got there yet. <laughs> OK, the next thing we do is we study the studies of studies. <laughs> um, so we looked at a bunch of studies that had used different ways to find out how strong the consensus was. And I put this up because it's interesting that we worked, this is Naomi Orestes, she's a historian who did a, a study of consensus. We worked, John um, is a psychologist, we worked with communication people, they're computer scientists, geologists, Andy is a um, um, uh, a trolling geologist, actually. So a lot of people um, contributed to this, and it was very interesting in an interdisciplinary way to understand how these different people think. So how, how do you write a paper with a psychologist? That was really hard. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now we know the climate is changing. We know humans are causing it. We know it's going to be a problem in the future. Um, why, what do we do? So again, the science strategy is, well, CO2 is going to the atmosphere, it's causing problems. Obviously, what you do is you stop emitting CO2, period, and we're done. <laughs> Somehow, that was not happening. Um, and it turns out people, including me, like, we like our iPhones, we like the projectors, we like our cars, not doing it. So who is the responsibility is to do something? Why doesn't somebody do something? Um, well, I can turn off the light. Well, but that wasn't enough. So I went to Washington. <laughs> <laughs> Who is going to do something about this issue? Um, this is the State Department. I was there in 2013-2014 as a Jefferson Science Fellow. So that's an international um, position in the State Department. Big, ugly gray building. It's really ugly. It's ugly inside, too. Um, but it's a lovely lobby with all the flags of the countries that we um, so I often have to tell people what the State Department is. It's not where you go and get your driver's license. <laughs> That's a different department. <laughs> different State Department. Um, it is the it is the government's the U.S. government's um, interaction with the rest of the world. And there's some two hundred over two hundred and fifty embassies, consulates, and other missions around the world where people from the United States will work on new United States interests in those countries. So those countries have embassies in Washington. We have embassies and consulates there. Um, much of the responsibility is just to take care of Americans who happen to be in wherever, South Africa, they get in trouble. But another part of it is to interact with the local governments, understand what their rules and regulations are, how um, how we can jointly move forward. Um, the State Department at that time had been getting increasingly interested in environmental problems because environmental problems are international. Not just climate, but air pollution, freshwater, freshwater endangered species, mercury, and people here on campus um, who work on mercury and it travels around the globe. Um, chemical use and disposal, oil spills, Arctic and Antarctic policy, 
biodiversity, all kinds of ocean things. All of these things cross borders. And you can't, the EPA can't regulate cross borders. Right? We can't make another country stop emitting mercury. We have to work with them collaboratively or their government takes steps to eliminate those, those problems. And so climate is a big one, but it's not the only one. How do we do that? Well, this is a lot of policy. I don't want to get into all this. But the main thing that we want to do is convince other governments to pass and enforce strong environmental laws. Um, we want to influence their national policies in other ways on energy, uh, with tax incentives, on how they regulate business, with all kinds of things. Again, we can't pass the laws. We can only convince them this would be a good thing to do. And then there's a development assistance program where we can a tiny, tiny, tiny amount of U.S. government money goes to support projects that advance these goals overseas. We can do that with bilateral agreements, U.S. and China. While I was in the State Department, we did talk and continuously, this is a lot of work, it's a long time, I was involved in some of that, to jointly make an agreement to move ahead on climate. And that was a roadblock for the rest of the world following. Lots and lots of behind the scenes work to do that. Um, but bilateral agreements can be made with the any country. That's two, two countries. Multilateral agreements are many countries. Um, the State Department works with the United Nations, with um, USAID. There are finance, private sectors, non government organizations who all impact environmental issues. Um, if we have a chance to do that. So while I was in Washington, um, there was the buildup for two major successes in international environmental issues that came up in and were passed in 2015, the year after I left. So there was a lot of work going on at the time on these issues. We talked about them in sequence. The first one is the Sustainable Development Goals. All of the countries in the UN, 193 countries, approved this um, this resolution on the, they call it, the future we want. And it's probably not very well known yet in the US, but basically this was worked on for years and years and years, following up from the Millennial Development Goals that were aimed at, at helping poor nations, people in poor nations, um, develop. So was the, the Millennium Goals were, were aimed at poverty reduction and hunger reduction. Those are still here in the Sustainable Development Goals, but these goals are what we want the future to look like for everybody. Now, the UN is scary to some people around here. There's nothing binding in here. The UN can't make anybody do anything. This is a joint wish list. There's lots of underlying targets and things. How do you measure these things? What do you mean by quality education, how are you going to measure that? And countries um, who signed on to this hopefully will move forward on all these goals or they might pick some that they like and work harder on. Notice, can you, I don't know if you can, can you read this? Okay. So notice that climate action is on your number 13. So climate action is important because, you know, it's all great, well and good if you have great health, but if you don't have a planet to live on, you're going to so, the second, um, excuse me, the second big success that was short on its heels, the Sustainable Development Goals were passed and agreed to in September, this was December, um, was the Paris Agreement on Climate. Again, a breakthrough agreement. Here's diplomats whooping it up, which is pretty rare. Um, <laughs> so the whole place erupted. Um, this was, again, all of the member nations of the United Nations agreed to take action on climate. That actually had been agreed on many years before, but agreed on a way to take action on climate. And this was a, a kind of a bottoms-up scheme. It was being developed while I was in the State Department. I worked with some of the people working on this, um, where countries were 
where countries bring forward their own proposal. This is what I'm going to do to cut my emissions in Dominican Republic, in Japan, in China, in you know, the EU. And the, the goal is for everybody to bring all of those plans forward, then to look at what the effects would be, and then to improve upon them. Again, it's non-binding. The, the, the pressure here is kind of um, peer pressure, right? You said you're going to do this. You said you were going to cut by 20% by 2050. Are you on track to do that? Um, so are we on track? Well, this was a huge, a huge success to have all these countries agree to do something. The, the um, original direction that the uh, projections were going were um, about four and a half degrees increase by the end of the century. Um, the Paris proposals would bring that to three and a half degrees. That's still out of range of what we think we should be aiming for, which is two or maybe one and a half. So this was a big step. It's a degree. It's a big step. That's a lot of cuts of emissions. How are we going to do this rest of the step? And the goal is that the parties will return every five years and ratchet success. So they're going to get better. They're going to find that the technologies that they had to cut um, are more efficient, they're cheaper, they're better, they're faster. They're, they can be improved. And so they can make their promises better. What does that look like in terms of the actual emissions schedule for carbon dioxide? Well, here is the trajectory that we're on, um, with some error bars here. Um, and this is emission of carbon dioxide equivalents um, per year. And so we're in on track to keep emitting more every year as, as economies grow and countries develop. Um, this is the Paris Agreement. So it's a little bit flat, and then developing countries are going to start industrializing faster and faster and emit more and more, is what this is saying. Um, the ratchet success to get down to below two degrees that we're aiming for, the, the amount of greenhouse gas that emitted per year has to go down every year by two, three, four percent essentially down to zero. So that original carbon cycle does not have additional accumulation in the atmosphere. That is really hard. That's hard. Cutting to 3% doesn't sound hard until you have to cut another 3% and another 3%. And in 10 or 20 years, you have to go down to 50% right, where you were. This is a big problem. Um, so, um, before I talk about solutions, I want to talk about one more thing that I have been involved in here. And that is that how, who decides, who helps countries figure out what to do, policymakers figure out what to do, how, how are we going to change the direction to veer towards these sustainable development goals, to veer towards a stable climate. And I've been a tiny, small piece of this environmental outlook. The United Nations has regularly put out these publications about um, what is the state of the environment, what is the policy effectiveness, and what does the future look like if we're on the track that we're on. Um, I tell people I'm working on GEO 6. I'm on the scientific advisory panel. And I say, because you've all read GEOs 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, right? <laughs> Um, nobody has. I've never heard of them. And one of our big pushes of the scientific advisory panel is to get these things more known, to get these projects more well known, because they're very interesting. They have a very big group of very well, um, um, very talented authors putting together these pieces and figuring out um, this policy effectiveness. I, I was astounded at this. We have, we have, there is no scientific way to measure policy effectiveness. Right. We're talking about passing a rule about what you can put in your stream in your local town and all the way up to the global climate agreement. 
like which, how do you decide in which policy is effective? Maybe who knows? <laughs> um, how do you even you know, decide what the policy is designed to do, what it, it, did it do it? This is hard. So there's a lot of effort in, the, in these chapters. All right, solutions. <laughs> you can't end on bad news, so here's some solutions. So bad news is this is a really hard problem. Okay? You can recycle and bicycle and put up solar panels and turn out the lights, and we should all do all those things. It's really important. But even if everybody does all those things, it's not enough. This problem is too hard for that. Um, on the plus side, for scientists and engineers, all that we have to do is redesign the whole global <laughs> energy system and everything that depends on it comes from energy. And as, as Mary Durfee said, this is guaranteed employment for engineers for the infinite future. <laughs> There's a lot of work to be done. Um, this can be done, but it, it, this is a lot of work. There's a lot of things that need to be, need to be worked on here. Okay. The better news is that there is progress. Okay? Collective action can really change the world. Um, we have the Paris Agreement, we have the Sustainable Development Goals. We're moving the ship off of its track towards where we want to go. Um, it requires what I'm calling Earth, Earth system thinking. So whatever you're doing, you need to think about its impact from the micro scale to the, to the global scale. And so one of the things I've done is started some new courses, climate science and policy course, and read chemistry course. I didn't get to talk about green chemistry here much today, sorry. Um, and we can accumulate our efforts as we work in all of our different domains to, um, to think about their impacts on the earth. We can also talk about what matters. And this issue comes up a lot, so I'll spend a second on it. Um, people complain that they're not listening over there, and they're not doing what we want. And if I had my animations going, it would say, you know, we're throwing balls at each other and we're not listening. Um, but working with psychologists and these communication people I get um, a little bit more of a view here, is that the people that you're talking to might be your tribe, um, might be some casual acquaintances. It's not gonna, you're not gonna convince anybody talking to your tribe if they're already, if they're already convinced, if they're already on your side. And you, you have some wider latitude here. And really what you need to do is talk to people who talk to people who can bridge these gaps. Right? Sometimes it's community people, sometimes they say it's the person sitting next to you on the ski lift, it's the person whom you meet on the bus, it's somebody um, who has some casual uh, um, interactions with. And those are the people at the edges of your network but who are not in your tribe that you can, you can convince about what are the important issues. It's found that actually people underestimate how much the rest of the world um, agrees with them on issues of sustainability. They don't have to even believe in climate science. If you believe in the, if you um, promote the solutions, you'll be there. Okay, so how to act, think about um, molecules to planet, talk, join no national, local, international action groups, a casual um, member, or you can really work with those groups. Talk to policymakers, they're driven by people who they're making policy for. Business <coughs> people, non government organizations, educators all have your problems. Um, all kinds of um, fields are important. This is the academic world here. It's great right if I left any fields out. Um, and we think it's the whole world, and of course chemistry is at the center because everything is made out of molecules. <laughs> um, but actually we're not all the really at the center because the policy people who are trying to get to where we're going, they need to know the science, but they need to know a lot of other ways of working with people, of getting consensus, of building coalitions, of getting there, and they need to work on all different scales, on the spheres here. All right, I'm going to end with that point because I've used up a lot of your time. I thank you so much 
for listening. I want to thank, I think, the thousands of scientists, engineers, students, people out in the field collecting tiny bits of sample and working hard in the lab to get this data are not appreciated enough. There's been really a huge amount of work in all of this. Michigan Tech, Chemistry Department, Great Lakes Research Center, Earth Planetary Space Sciences, the Skeptical Science Team, National Academies, who provide the Jefferson Fellowship, uh, colleagues and students, my husband, Floyd Anderson, who is actually wearing a tie. I <laughs> <laughs> told him this morning I had to wear a tie to this event. <laughs> he has been unwaveringly supportive of everything I've tried to do. Mary Durfee, who was instrumental in getting me to apply for and go to the Jefferson Science Fellowship, and Mike Abbott for bringing me out to this event. <laughs> thank and thank you to you also. All right.